Hello to everybody. Um, so, um, so we we are going to talk about covering conflict and covering difficult situations where internal conflicts are happening. So we have Mir Wise from a uh, correspondent of TRT News from Turkey in Afghanistan. He's covered very difficult uh, situations and spots in Afghanistan. He's been to the Kunduz region. He's been to the border of Baluchistan, to Kandahar. Um, he's told very difficult stories. Uh, many of them um, uh, granted him a lot of harassment and, and, and a lot of pressure from, from authorities. We have Malini Subramanian. She, she's, uh, she works uh, with the online site called Scroll from India. She has been covering Southeast uh, state of India where there is a very big conflict with the Maoists and she's been also told very difficult stories about what people, civilians are suffering and how they're living there and the and she's also had, had uh, a lot of uh, harassment and pressures and all of that because she's trying to tell the right story and the CPJ is giving her a big award this year for her courage. And we have uh, um, Kanak Dixit, who is the brother of Kunda Dixit, who is the person who's supposed to be here, who's our Nepalese uh, host, uh, one of the leading journalistic figures of Nepal, uh, the director of the Nepali Times, and one of the founders of the investigative reporting in Nepal. And unfortunately, he cannot be here, and Kanak will tell us why. But uh, he, he, he has, he, 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 it's not because he doesn't want to be here, it's because he was forced to, to leave the country uh, for political reasons. So, um, but Kana can tell us a little bit about it. So let's, and my, my, my name is Maria Ronderos. I work with the Open Society Foundations, but I've been also, uh, all my life I've been a reporter in Colombia, in South America, where there has been a very long internal conflict, which we are hopefully about to end because there's going to be a decision in the 2nd of October where there, there's going to be a, the peace treaty will be ratified and this will end 52, 52 years of war. So we'll, we'll wait and see. So, uh, so I'm going to do some little reference about my own experience covering the conflict, but mostly what we came here is to listen to them. So Mir Weiss, it's, you can do your presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, working in Afghanistan in a place where we are still in war. Uh, when I uh, when I uh, burn in this country before that the war was started in my country, so the the the, the, the sounds of bullets and bombs and blasts are the voices of my childhood. Uh, so whenever I'm going to a conflict related area, so. Uh, uh, I'm not affected too much, but yeah, we journalists are not uh, some special spaces to be like, uh, uh, we have to take care of ourselves as well, but we are very, uh, we are not that much worried to go to the north or to the south part of our country to cover the country. Uh, uh, Afghanistan has been the most dangerous country in the world after Syria for journalists, uh, 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 more than 58 journalists have been killed in Afghanistan in the last few years. And uh, we have uh, problems not only with, uh, with the Taliban, they are fighting against the government, they don't want freedom of press, uh, uh, but we have problems with the government, and the government is worried about uh, what we are working for, because this is our duty to, to unveil the untold stories the corruption related stories, the, uh, the civilian casualties, and uh, according to our constitution, the government is like, uh, they are, the government of Afghanistan have to be accountable for, uh, for uh, what they are doing in the, in the war zone. But they want to hide the numbers and the figures and the civilian, they want to 
high the, the casualty number of the civilian. This is why we are, fi we are n like not only a journalist working as a journalist, but we are fighting as a journalist yeah, in this area. Uh, I will, uh, uh, this is a, a, a hospital mm. in Kunduz province in north of Afghanistan. Uh, it belongs to Medicine Sun Frontiers. Uh, uh, you may know that organization. They have hospitals in war zone. Uh, this was attacked by the U.S. forces on, uh, in 2015 in September. Uh, on that time, uh, me and my cameraman, we were in Kunduz province. It's three hours from Kabul. We were there on the night, and we, uh, we had planned, we had an interview with uh, some of the Taliban commanders in the area. Uh, they was very close to the city on that time, but they was uh, close to the city, but the city was in control of the government. So when we reached there during the night, we had planned to go where to uh, have our interview with these guys. Uh, the city collapsed to the hand of Taliban. So uh, we know that and we realize that in war zone, in every minute, the situation is like uh, have to be changed and you cannot rely on situation. So the city collapsed to the hand of Taliban and we in that time, uh, so the interview was canceled and uh, there was no access to internet but we was lucky we had access to mobile phones. So my, f my friend told me that let's, let's move from the city to a safe place. Uh, but it was hard because the city was surrounded uh, all the main road was uh, in the Taliban's control. So uh, my decision was that to stay in the city and we will see what's going on in the city and w what will happen to the people because we, this is a good place and to have report on that because the Taliban are against the human rights, they are against the law, they are against the free media. Even they use some of the reports as a propaganda tool for themselves. So we got a call during the night we was in our place. We got a call from our office and they told us that a, a hospital of uh, uh, international organization is uh, attacked by U.S. forces. So if you can cover that story or uh, at least you find some image and some videos of, of that. So uh, one thing I want to share with you in the war zone, this is only journalists to take decision to go 100 yards forward or not. And we are lucky that we are not forced by our uh, desk or by our editors to move forward to do this or not, yeah. So me and my friend, he was local of this city. We, we went closer to the hospital site uh, in, the, in the darkness. The Taliban asked us and we said we are not journalists. We, are, we just want to visit some of our friends, they was working in hospital. So they let us go and we reached the hospital and we took some videos and some photos and uh, everything was destroyed and it was like, a, the situation was very tough there. And then we returned back to the city and uh, we flee from that city to mazar sharif it's another city. And we use the burqa. Burqa is mainly used by women. So we use burqa for our safety. Yeah, we reached Mazar Sharif we, uh, with two local drivers. So we reached Mazar Sharif, and we luckily, when we, uh, when I saw my friend in Mazar, when we get out of the car, his shoes was men's shoes, but his burqa was belong to women. We was lucky that no one recognized us during the way that these guys are like what? Yeah, li like ladies. Yeah, but luckily we reached Mazar, so there was not, everything was in control. In Afghanistan, we have uh, Taliban, we have warlords, the warlords, uh, drag lords. Uh, you know our country, 92% uh, of all heroin in the world is producing and in our country. Cultivation of poppy, we, have, we are number one in the world. Yeah, b we earn big money. And uh, the government agencies, uh, we have uh, like these, these uh, three, four, five are like against the, f the free media. Even they are, they say we are good with you guys, but they are not good. 
uh, Taliban, from one side, they are uh, opposite of free media. They are opposite. They, they, are, they don't want the women to be in TVs. They don't want women to report on uh, as, as, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan and the situation. But these guys use YouTube, Facebook, uh, Weber, everything. They have access to social media. And time by time, they send uh, their about their activities and this stuff. But whenever we, we have a story on a, on a topic, uh, on an issue, so when we don't ask their uh, comment on that, yeah, then we receive a call from them. And then they say, oh, this is not true, and it's not, uh, mm, yeah, in, in media you have to balance your story and why you're not asking us, and like this, yeah. Uh, in 2016, two, two journalists killed in Afghanistan, but after the 9-11, uh, 58 journalists killed in Afghanistan, uh, I'm wondering why some of the, there are conflicting numbers 58, this is the number which our local media support agencies provide to us. But when I check the uh, CIJ, CPJ, and reporter, uh, Reporters Without Border, they say 28. I'm wondering why there is difference between number. But the numbers we have is 58, and in 2016, two lost. And uh, this guy in the right, yeah, he is very, he was a close friend of me. He was working with he Sardar. He working for, uh, for uh, France Press, and he was killed with two of his babies and wife in a hotel. And one child was survived. He was two years old, and he was injured, but uh, he is uh, okay now, and he he has nothing. He lost mom, dad, everything, and he is now with his relatives. Anya. In the, in the first row, in the top left. Uh, she was uh, killed uh, by two police officers in the east of our country. And um, this lady was working for Associated Press. And these two police officers were arrested after. But after six months, both were released by the government. These are other brave journalists. Uh, one is from Sweden. He was killed just close to me when I was in a travel agency purchasing a ticket. He was killed on a roadside. He told me three days before when he visited Kabul, he told me that I'm going to cover a story about the corruption of, uh, of high-ranking Afghan officials and the elite family. So he was killed in a very, in a green zone area, in a very, like, uh, it's a secured area, but he was killed, yeah? These journalists, brave journalists, lost their lives. And these two guys, one's from US and one from Australia, they are killed in Afghanistan. Uh, wars and journalists uh, of the past uh, encountered uh, relatively little danger compared to today. Uh, only two journalists uh, covering uh, killed um, in uh, World War I, 63 in World War II, but more than 50 just killed after 9-11 in Afghanistan. Uh, these are my friends. They, they was working with um, his David and uh, his Mr. Tamana. They, they was working with um, US NPR, National Public Radio. They was killing in Marja district. They was in a convoy with the Afghan army, but both were killed. Uh, there was no one else was killed in the convoy, which was ambushed by Taliban, but these two guys were killed. And no one, still, those killers are walking free and yeah, culture of impunity. And just the day before yesterday, this is, uh, he is a, a well-known warlord from the, uh, when we, st uh, you know, Afghanistan block, uh, blocked the, the way for the movement of Russia toward the India and Pakistan. And this guy with the black turban, uh, he was, uh, he is a well-known warlord. Since uh, 1987, he is fighting in Afghanistan till the day before yesterday. We just got a, uh, reach a peace deal with him, the government, the day before yesterday. And he is the killer of that person. He is a BBC reporter, Mirwais Jalil. And we got a peace deal with uh, the group, but uh, 
Yeah, he, the Midwest Jalil had an interview with him, and when he returned back from a nearby area to Kabul, he was killed by the direct order of this Mr. Hikmatyar. But Hikmatyar is now back to power, to, to Afghanistan. It shows that the government of Afghanistan is not yeah, v v supporting free media. Yeah? They, they, f they give uh, mm, killers. Uh, uh, we are lucky that, uh, that our offices are not forcing us to move forward in the conflict zone. This is we and our team to take decision where to go or where to go not. Yeah? And um, I believe even there are too much threats we are facing in war zone from warlords, insurgents, and drag mafia. But the beauty of our job, uh, we choose is more than the ones we will get in the line of duty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very Okay, <clears throat> a very good morning to everybody. And let me take the opportunity to thank the organizer for bringing me here. And I feel also very privileged to be amongst you and also amongst the rich panelists that we see here. Um, I am told I'm not going to get into too many of details. I've got 20 minutes of presentation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the kind of challenges that I and some of the other journalists that we faced covering, or rather, as I say, uncovering the stories beyond the official version uh, of the conflict in India. And <clears throat> I think uh, many people may not be aware of the kinds of conflict that is happening in India, uh, other than Jammu Kashmir. Uh, but there are lots more and serious ones which we've been trying to cover. So before I get on to the main theme of the kind of challenges that we're facing, I think it's important to put the context in place. Uh, without getting too much into details and not getting into too much of details of the, what the map is, uh, uh, you know, getting into the reading of the map, I think it's important to just take a look. This is a chronic conflict map. Yeah? Now, this is developed by uh, organization called South, e South Asian uh, Terrorism Portal. And this is, they have looked at all the conflicts within India. And you can see where it seems to be spreading. A yeah? uh, lot more to the eastern, to the states in the northeastern uh, portion of India, to the eastern side of India, and of course, to Jammu Kashmir. Now, if we look specifically at Maoist conflict, now that is what I'm going to focus on. The presence of uh, uh, a group which believes in Maoism and which has been having a protracted kind of a war in India, uh, 49 year old, is what the focus of uh, my theme would be, because these are the stories that I've been covering. But if you look at the map here, it is, uh, you can see the eastern belt, south, southern and a little bit of eastern belt that is being covered, and portions of uh, states in the no no northeast. I'm also not going to talk about the entire belt where the uh, conflict is, because it's huge. You know, India is a huge country. It's difficult to cover all that. Uh, there have been people reporting sporadically from various places. Uh, I'm going to focus on one state called Chhattisgarh, uh, which has actually been carved out of the central portion of India. Is it a That is a central part, and it has been carved out of this, which is Madhya Pradesh. And 2000, <coughs> this state was formed, Chhattisgarh. Not many people in India also know that Chhattisgarh is now a different state. Yeah? It, just to give you an understanding of which state I'm talking about, this is a state, right? And when it was formed in 2000, uh, Chhattisgarh had only 16 districts. But today, it is like really 
divided into 27 districts. Uh, that is, as the government says, for better governance, and we also see for better policing. And within that, again, I'm not going to talk about the entire state, but it is last, largely this. Do you see, if you see the word Kanker and anything be, below that. So these seven districts uh, in the southern part of Chhattisgarh is what I'm going to focus, focus on. But the conflict of, uh, the, the, the kind of conflict that I'm talking about is also, the northern part of Chhattisgarh was also gripped in the Maoist conflict. But uh, it is uh, being said by the government that in the past two years, of ex excessive uh, policing, they have been able to drive out the Maoists, uh, which is a little difficult to believe because it's it's uh, the neighboring state is Jharkhand, which, uh, which is another state, and uh, Jharkhand continues to have a uh, lot of uh, conflict related to the Maoism, and it is the neighboring districts will definitely have a fallout. Yeah? A few stories I covered in the Northern Belt, but uh, largely I'm going to focus on the southern part of uh, Chhattisgarh. Yeah? So even this was actually just three districts, but today it has become, uh, it has been divided into seven districts. So this is the region that I'm talking about. This region is called Bastar, uh, and uh, it's a 40,000 square kilometers area which is as big as the state of Kerala, or almost close to the country Switzerland. So that's the geographical scope that one is talking about. Um, and once again, you know, within that also, it's a southern portion which is uh, uh, largely affected because uh, it is believed that the Maoist leaders are all uh, in the forests in that, in that belt, and therefore there is a lot of uh, uh, militarization or uh, rather kind of, you know, forceful entry into those areas, making it all the more difficult for the people living there. Okay, having said this, it is important now to look at some other maps. Look at this map. This is the uh, map of minerals in India. Okay? We're not getting into the details of what the minerals are. It's largely coal, iron ore, bauxite, manganese, tin, yeah? very rich in minerals. Again, you see, just look at the, where the uh, deposits are. <clears throat> Let us look an, uh, at another map in India, the forest map. Right? Uh, you also see that this area is also thickly forested. Yeah? And uh, so you have a high mineral resources in those places, and also heavily forested uh, region, exactly in those areas where we are talking about the, we saw the conflict map, yeah? So I'm just asking you to relate to that. Now, this is a map which uh, sort of locates the scheduled tribe population in India. Uh, we have about 8.6% uh, of scheduled tribes in India, which are the indigenous Adivasi community and largely living again in those very areas. You see the blue portion, the darker the blue, the higher the percentage. Chhattisgarh is a little larger, the northeastern states are a little higher again. We come back to the state. Am I blocking the view? We come back to the state of Chhattisgarh to look at the mineral map. Yeah? And again, uh, if you see this is the portion that I'm going to focus on. Uh, this particular area is highly concentrated in conflict, and this has the best of iron ore. It is going straight out to Japan. Uh, raw iron ore just is lifted out and is, is sent out. And uh, some of the other places has dolomite and tin and bauxite, yeah? and also limestone. So a lot of construction activities that supports this area. Um, look at the map, the forest map in Chhattisgarh. Once again, you'll see that the southern part is quite thickly forested. Yeah. Um, now, if you look at this map, uh, the brown triangles look at the tribal-dominated places, and the rest of the portions you see that 
there have been industries and mining uh, projects that have been sanctioned. Yeah? So very clearly, you can see the way uh, where the, the, the conflict is lying and why it is also lying. While we may not be getting into a detailed discussion uh, about the extraction of the natural resources and who is having it and how is the government supporting it and what the laws related to the land, etc., are, we're going to focus more on what is happening to the civilians there uh, who have been living there for generations together. <clears throat> Now, we, uh, I spoke about uh, specifically the conflict uh, which is now between the banned CPI Maoist and the government forces. Right? Now, if you look at the timeline of, the, of Maoism in India, uh, it's not very new. It has had a history of 49 years. Okay? So uh, most of you can see what is uh, sort of I just pulled out some of the uh, documents and looked at the timeline, but it's important to look at some of the important uh, uh, events. Yeah? So just remember, it started off in 1967. Yeah? And what happened in 1967 is that gradually it, it started off in a small place called Naxalbari, which was a place in West Bengal. And there was a lot of discontent that despite independence, there were a large number of population which was landless. Yeah? So the struggle or the fight for land began, and the revolution began from that particular place. So even today, uh, the, even, you know, the, the, the movement has moved further. It's, it's, we'll see that it has gone to the south of India and moved to the eastern part of India. But all the same, they're, they're called in the local parlance as Naxalites. Uh, because of the Naxal Bari, uh, that, that origin continues to stay with them. Um, I'm not getting into details of the leaders and what happened to them, but largely it also went through a lot of uh, upheaval in the sense that by the 70s there were a lot of uh, uh, groups that were formed, there were a lot of ideological differences, and with the emergency in 1975-76, a lot of leaders were caught and also put into prison, and some, many of them died. Uh, and you know, the government also thought that the movement has taken a backseat and they, have, they are now uh, you know, out of the memory of the people. But they again reemerged in the 80s. And you could see that they came about in the, uh, as part of the Telangana struggle, uh, which is in the, uh, the erstwhile Andhra Pradesh, uh, which Andhra Pradesh is now divided into two uh, uh, states, which is Telangana and uh, Andhra Pradesh. So the Telangana movement was also related to land, there were a lot of landlessness uh, and a lot of uh, uh, discontent with the landlessness, and the movement again saw uh, an upsurge in those areas. And okay, yeah. So and gradually you'll see that this this enters this uh, uh, the movement by 80s begin to enter into Chhattisgarh, the state that we are now going to talk about, and. Uh, that was a place where the Shedil tribes or the Adivasis live, in the midst of forest, right on top of a uh, lot of natural resources, right? And uh, Adivasis, I must quickly also say that they have a long history of um, fight against uh, the Britishers during the independence struggle when they wanted to take away the natural resources. So they have a history of struggles. Hmm? So, uh, what happened in the state is that uh, as the, uh, there, there was a peace negotiation which was initiated in uh, Andhra Pradesh in 1999 to 2003, which did not uh, materialize, succeed, and therefore there were a lot of uh, military operations and they moved into Chhattisgarh. And what happened is in 2000, around 2005, a uh, lot of locals were uh, being armed as the militia, as the this, uh, vigilant group, and, and they were also armed by the state, as well as the center, and then began a huge uh, kind of a, you know, a, a, a kind of a violence was unleashed onto the public there, almost pushing them to take positions between the Maoists and the government. Yeah? 
And this went on. And what we now see in 2015 is a second phase of it, of which we, uh, uh, me along with some of the other journalists and the lawyers and activists, have faced the brunt of that period in 2016. That is very much this year. Now, what is the kind of challenges that one faces in this region? I want to quickly look at that. Of course, language. You know, uh, India is, has about 27 official languages and many more uh, dialects. And, uh, and in this particular region, which you talk about 40,000 square kilometers, has a number of dialects. Yeah? And the Adivasis do not speak Hindi. So there is a huge uh, problem in even reaching out to them and listening to their uh, stories in their own language. So, which is why it's very important to keep a translator with us uh, and even uh, you know, find a way of uh, understanding the way they're expressing what they're experiencing. Uh, I must also say, even, even uh, when an incident happens, uh, they are not able to tell us uh, as to wh when exactly it happened, what the date was. Yeah? They, they'll have to go back to their, the, the weekly heart or the weekly market that was there. At, it was on that, on that day or the day before that it happened. So you have to sit and calculate even the dates that incidents have occurred. Hmm? Distances are many. There are, I mean, far-flung far villages. It's very difficult to reach out to those places. They are forested path. A lot of the interior areas are landmines. So those are the kind of risks uh, that uh, a lot of journalists take in. Uh, a lot of you know simple things like there will be many villages within this having this similar name. So you might end up in a village having a similar name, but actually you know you needed to go to some other. So you you know the exercise of looking at which exactly which gram panchayat that is located in is is, an, uh, is something which you need to bear in mind. Uh, physical dangers or difficulties. A lot of forests, so a lot of snakes, and uh, highly mosquito infested. So a lot of journalists come up, uh, uh, and people who reside there, of course, have built the resistance. But there is a high prevalence of malaria, uh, serious malaria, uh, uh, around this region. So also, you have to have uh, good physical fitness to be able to walk on to this. You know, you walk 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers to reach up to those places, uh, or have somebody to arrange you to take you on a mobike. Uh, or drive it yourself. Uh, it is also very time-taking. Often you organize to meet somebody that person has not reached because something has happened in the village. And communication is, an, is a very, very tough thing because there are no telephonic communication that are happening. So it has to be uh, by word of mouth. So you, you would assume that you know, the word that you sent across to that person would have reached, and that person would meet you and take you around there. So there, there is a huge. Uh, communication issue, and uh, which is why you know often you take a couple of days time, and by the time you reach there, you end up spending five days or seven days uh, covering a particular story. Uh, there are a lot of security camps. In fact, every three kilometers there are security camps, which means that you have to also register yourself constantly around those uh, area. Uh, ground zero news becomes very high risk uh, because of reaching these places. Uh, also, you know. Uh, not reaching on time, you are not able to collect the facts as it is. People would have moved out to another place. Those are the difficulties that you, that you face. Uh, and, and you know, often on a daily reporting, you can only report about the incident that has happened, but not the actual story. In fact, uh, I was, uh, I'm happy to be reporting to some uh, an agency like Scroll, which allows you the time to take to go back to that region after a couple of days in order for the real story to come, come out. Uh, so I, I covered that we were, it's difficult to verify the facts. Uh, apart from reaching, it's also difficult to verify the facts with the other party, with all the parties in the conflict. Because if you re do reach out to the other party, uh, the government will always accuse you of colliding with them and also have uh, cases against you. There are, we already have a lot of friends in, in prison because of that. Um, and uh, there is a heavy pressure on the, uh, from the state machinery to report their version. Yeah? Uh, remember, this is a conflict uh, area, an armed conflict area, but uh, it does not, India, government of India does not recognize it as a arm, non-international armed conflict because it, within the parameters of the uh, international humanitarian law, it would be defined in that sense. So which is why uh, the entire place is dealt with as a law and order situation. So which means that you, you have huge uh, 
uh, numbers of prisoners sitting there with heavy criminal laws against them. Yeah? So there are no principles that are being followed yeah? uh, while uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, kind of a situation. So if you don't report the police version, they're not going to respond to you. So you, you, know, you, you, come, you can come across a lot of difficulties. You've, you would have gone to the camp and registered and this. They would immediately have a message that uh, this and this so-and-so reporter is coming, and therefore access cannot be allowed. A few advantage, uh, I'm going from my experience, where a couple of them, which is that I worked in the area within the humanitarian organization called International Committee of the Red Cross. So I was familiar with the terrain, familiar with the people there. So that really helped me to build a trust that is highly required in those areas. Uh, my previous interaction with the government officials as well as supporters of the Maoists helped me to gauge where they stand. So it helped me to make my way or craft my way into those uh, places. Uh, having been trained with the International uh, Red Cross principles uh, of being uh, on humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and also independence, that helped me. So I constantly use that in order to send across a message that no party would be benefiting by any kind of a report that, we are, that I would be doing. Uh, based on that, uh, something, because often you wonder, how do you get the news? Because if communication is poor, and if uh, paper is not reporting, because that is one of the major things that local news were constantly suppressed from bringing out the news because government does not want the larger world to know that there is a conflict situation in India, uh, and which means that you know, we are talking about 10 states being affected by, uh, by the Maoist conflict. Yeah? And the government does not want to even use the word conflict, leave alone armed conflict. But how to sniff the news, how to look, look for the right kind of news was an important uh, aspect, where scanning local newspapers, uh, regular haunts like the hospitals, you know, somebody is going to come with an injury, uh, look at that part. And also uh, recognizing certain patterns in the press releases was also useful to know that, OK, there is something, something wrong with the kind of press releases that the police is giving out. Uh, it was important to develop a vast network of uh, ground level contacts. So while the ground level contact in meant village level contact who could pass the information of some arrests that have happened, it was uh, uh, you know, the dangers of because our telephones were being tapped, uh, monitored. So we didn't want to put the other people into uh, any kind of danger. So you know, it had to be very cautiously uh, uh, managed. We also, I took the principle of not rushing into cover because otherwise you'll only cover what happened, how many killed, how many injured. So the story behind that uh, also always happens a little later, as I told you. And I got that, uh, I, I felt that, it, you know, the better analysis of the story came a little after some of the events that took place. Uh, there were a few advantages and disadvantages of living within the region, because I lived in this place, in the city, close to where the conflict area was. Uh, while the advantages was that you could feel the pulse of where the conflict is moving, how it is happening, and what steps are being taken, and also look at the uh, authorities in different uh, forms no, of their own, uh, um, of their, uh, in their affairs. Uh, the, Disadvantages, of course, was also that they could easily monitor you. You were exposing yourself a lot more to the threats that were coming, gradually coming on to me and also your family to the threats. Uh, it was important to work as a team, which I actually could not do because by the time you uh, built a local network of people who were, you know, who would cover for you and who could uh, sort of, you could go together as a team, uh, they were fast enough to uh, throw a lot of people out. Uh, because being in a team helped us, because it was a, uh, useful to be secure in that, uh, in that area by being a group of journalists, otherwise single journalists. Okay, okay, I'm just, it's the last one. Yeah. No, I'm sorry to cut you late. Okay, okay. Uh, you can pass it on, the sheet to people. Okay, I'll just run it down. Okay, some of the... Uh, Right, so I'll close it here. I'm really exceeding the time, but uh, the experience was uh, uh, quite um, 
invigorating, but also extremely, uh, how do you say, threatening to you as an individual. And I'm sure a lot of people who have experienced this can understand what uh, journalists go through this kind of situation. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Thanks. I think the right way to describe my presence here in a discussion related to conflict is that I was ambushed. Uh, Namrata asked me to fill in for my brother, who should have been here. My brother Kunda, and that's a different story in itself as to why he's not here. Let that be for now, and I'll try to make up for... And he's, uh, he's somebody with a broader understanding of world conflict, having... Uh, covered the Philippines and Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka at the height of the conflict. So he would have had, and besides the Nepal conflict, uh, and his comparative knowledge. So he would have had an, certainly a different nuance to the presentation. Let me try my best to fill in for him. And also in the audience, I have my colleague Anohita Mojumdar, uh, editor of Himal South Asian, uh, who also has experience covering um, large parts of conflict in India, but also Afghanistan over eight years. So in a way, I feel uh, a bit inadequate, but let me jump in. <clears throat> Till about 19, early 1990s, the, my line to my friends from the rest of South, um, South Asia was that we've had it easy in Nepal. You guys have had partitions, conflicts, pogroms, etc. But in Nepal, we've had it easy, and Therefore, perhaps we haven't learned enough. Well, came 1996 and the Maoist conflict began. And uh, I can tell you that we didn't know how to cover conflict then. In a way, now we do. Uh, it was an immersion. It was a decade-long war from 1996 to 2006, uh, an internal conflict. Uh, started by the Maoists with a fair degree of brutality. Then the, Ma the state responding with uh, its own scorched earth pro uh, policy. And once the, first the army was allowed to, uh, army was, uh, was stayed in the camps, in the cantonments. It was the police with point, uh, with bird shot guns used to, and asked to respond to a insurgency. The army stayed in the barracks for six years before it came out, once it got attacked. So this 10-year conflict, uh, six years was fought by the civilian police. Um, the Maoists utilized the terrain of Nepal to advantage, uh, which is that we have the ravines of Afghanistan and we have the undergrowth of Vietnam. That makes it ideal guerrilla territory where there are not enough places for the uh, roads for the, for the security forces to land up. Besides, they, also, they certainly took advantage of the fact that Nepal had been a Kathmandu-centric state since historical time. So there was, in the modern era, there was lots of pent-up frustrations about neglect by the Kathmandu-centric state. I won't go into that. I'll, there's lots to be said about why the conflict. <clears throat> More than that, uh, in terms of covering the conflict, uh, lots of interesting aspects, but I will only focus on a few. One of them is that it is really the local Nepali speaking and Nepali writing journalists that covered this war, this conflict. I hesitate to say war. Um, it actually was an internal conflict. Um, and uh, so if there is any credit to be given for the fact that uh, the reality of the hinterland came out to the urban spaces, to Kathmandu Valley, and then also went overseas or international as to the reality of the war, then the, the credit that that should be given is to the local on the ground journalists of Nepal uh, I don't think they have been credited enough because they have moved on we've all moved on and the people who took 
full advantage of the of the conflict during the conflict was the the conflict uh, uh, the industry that came up soon enough in Kathmandu Valley the workshops and the seminars during conflict and then the post conflict but the journalists who did the coverage uh, in extremely difficult circumstances between the state and the maoists being really on the ground i think they remain with us as journalists nobody has really done the job of covering the challenges that they faced quite a few of them were murdered disappeared um, many of them faced trauma but uh, given that the nepali language journalist has moved on to continue to cover nepali do nepali language journalism uh, there are a few write up that are coming up now the one that i would not about journalists but what the journalists saw um, finally i uh, there are a few non polemic polemical books out there the one that i would recommend if you were to read uh, nepali would be manta haraya ko jug by mohan mainali um, which in a way represents the the experiences of journalists on the ground all over nepal <coughs> so the people of nepal were caught in a pincer between the maoists and the state the state was also brutal and the state once the, especially once the army got involved they were uh, killed more people because of the firepower what is interesting is that this is the really in my reckoning this is the first time in historical time that that kind of violence visited the villages of nepal because earlier you had battles and fights and killings within the nobility in the what there's a great episode in nepali history from two and a half centuries ago known as the kot parva a lot of killings between elites that are fighting each other for power whereas the villages really where there was a, a lot of what you would call structural violence but there was not the kind of physical violence that visited the people of nepal the peasantry in these 10 years 1996 to 2006 and thank god it is over but also thank the journalists who actually covered it and made it real in real time and i believe that in the next few years because we're still going through this post conflict phase i think in the next few years we will start seeing more write ups of those days because the journalists are still around us some of them right in this in this room but the kind of stories that the journalists covered i i know for a fact that the first coverage of the use of child soldiers by the maoists were done by nepali journalists not by ngo wallas not even by human rights wallas certainly not by the peace wallas so uh, that for me is highly significant that even today we because the 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 conflict did not see a loser and so the it has uh, the the dinumo has taken more than a decade now since the conflict ended in 2006 but even today the talk of child soldiers is really not discussed but if you wanted the paper trail if you wanted the write ups about a most heinous activity of picking up children 12 year olds and 14 year olds and home and pushing them into conflict it is done by journalists so in many ways some of the work of the journalists done 10 15 years ago will still be useful for us to stabilize our society in in the future the kind of coverage that had to be done for example the extortion by maoists in the hinterland the extreme uh, cases of um, uh, violent uh, state activity by the army the police and the armed police including disappearances and murders in the case of uh, the the army they didn't have gunships so what they decided to do was they put up they they dropped 2 inch mortars from on high on nepali terrain which is the most highly the most dense terrain for any mountain region in the world so i would say that the journalists covered all of this they may not have had comparative knowledge to know how to cover it they learned on the job 
they also may not have the English to tell the world what they covered, but that was not their job. They saw their job as covering the conflict as it was happening. I should also mention that this was the, really the, one of the first digital conflicts of the world, which meant that the photographs were all there. And thousands and thousands of photographs of the conflict, when we have time to look up and notice it, they are still there for us to, for us to use. But I would like to end now by, the, the, by referring to not covering conflict, which is the title of this session, but covering post-conflict because that will be very significant also for Colombia, uh, what Nepal has gone through in the post-conflict era. Because in many ways, covering conflict is black and white. It's easy. It requires personal courage to go in there, into a hinterland, where there are Maoists or army men about. But post-conflict requires much more backgrounding, including how post-conflict works around the world, the whole process. Um, so I'll just go through a quick list of ideas that I will share and then I'll end. Um, I think uh, what happens is that the post-conflict you'll have, if the UN comes in, you have to understand the dynamic of the UN. For example, the United Nations mission to Nepal, which all of us, including myself, we welcomed, we wrote about it, we felt it had to come here against all the geopolitical forces that didn't want the UN in. But once it came here, I think it made mistakes that lengthened our peace process. I'll not go into it more than that, other than to say that somebody somewhere will have to do coverage and a PhD even, or two, on the report sent by Anmin to the Security Council, which, in my view, gave a distorted view of the Nepali peace forces to the international community. So we have to understand the United Nations, so that it does good for us rather than harm us more. We have to understand the donor proclivity because Nepal being a country where the donors are active and we, we do need donors, but do we know enough about the donors? What happens when uh, somebody comes here for a three-year stint, has a lot of money in his or her pocket and wants to do social engineering in a post-conflict situation? How much do we know and how much does the donor know about a country in a post-conflict situation? What do the neighbors do? Where do the neighbors, intelligence agencies get active? And when do we... Uh, as the national politicians get weakened, how do we ask uh, ourselves to catch our breath, to talk back to the people that think they know the answers for us? These are the kinds of things that I think we need to be, uh, that are hard to cover because we are not groomed for it. We can cover violence in our neighborhood as long as we have a bit of coverage, uh, courage and there is somebody to give us space in there. Um, I'll be done, I'll be another two minutes. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, but, I, but there are things that happen in Nepal that continue to be part of uh, what I would say conflict coverage, even though we're in a post-conflict area. Most interestingly, the Supreme Court of Nepal has really been a vanguard in transitional justice decisions. Decisions related to transitional justice itself was a term that had to be, it came from the elsewhere, and we had to translate it into Sankramar Kali Nyaya. No Nepali knew what it meant, but it was presented to us. We have grappled with it now for a decade, and I think Nepal is actually making advances in transitional justice, including in Supreme Court judgments. But how does the world get to know about it? Because unlike any, uh, every other country in South Asia, Nepal's Supreme Court decisions are written in Nepali. So that's homework for somebody else. However, the victims of conflict in Nepal actually have come together. The Maoist victims and the state victims have actually come together in what they call a common platform. I think that becomes a very interesting example. And I'll finally end with reference to the tragedy also that, that, uh, uh, that accompanies a post-conflict scenario. Nanda Prasad Adhikari, all he wanted was investigations into the murder of his son. He and his wife Ganga Maya sat on a hunger strike over years, uh, meaning uh, a con um, they demanded uh, justice for over years. Uh, he died while on hunger strike. The state, supposedly democratic, allowed him to die. But civil society, by and large, also allowed him to die. 
all of this has to do with this shake up of our society and undermining of values during conflict when you don't see a death for what it is i think that is where we are stuck right now as far as my brother is concerned he might have he would have definitely made a different type of presentation with different nuances all i can say is that he is very much interested in setting up a peace museum in nepal not a war museum he got involved with all those thousands of digital photographs kunda my brother did to put out three volumes first one of them is called a people war about how the people of nepal were locked in the pincers and those photographs were all taken by nepali journalists out there in the hinterland coming together and bringing to life the kind of tragedy that should never happen again in nepal and the best way to do that is not by do uh, by creating a war museum but by putting together a war uh, a peace museum with the help of the work of the journalists of nepal who covered conflict thank you thank you very much so um we'll have a little time for for a little conversation and a couple of questions the first thing i wanted to to ask you uh, mir wise is uh, you you always confronted people who wanted to stop uh, independent reporting you wanted to tell the stories you were telling me before the meeting you would wanted to tell the stories for example about <coughs> the recruiting of afghans to a foreign war why don't you tell us a little bit of how did you go about reporting independently despite the fact that you were being pressured mm -hmm. to to stop it uh let me say something about that story first uh, i was uh, uh, i had planned to have a report on um, you know we have a huge number of refugees in south asia and other part of the world uh, uh, we have more than one and a half million refugees in iran uh, some are uh, some have a legal document to stay there but some are illegal over there so when the war uh, started in Syria between the we call them freedom fighters or rebel groups with the state with the government so the iran is mainly the supporter of the assad regime so uh, the iran government tried to recruit the soldiers from the afghan illegal refugees to give them some benefits uh, those afghan refugees they want to join the to to support the assad regime the government of iran will provide them visas uh, for those they, for their family members like they will provide schools for their children and some other benefits like that so the iran re uh, government start uh, recruiting afghans from inside iran and send them to syria but when i try to contact the afghan governments how they are aware of that or Uh, how what's uh, their plan to stop this recruitment and this they was not ready to give us the information and uh, the data and whatever we want so uh, uh, from other side when i when i uh, there there is a, a good relation bet between afghanistan and united states but in the case of syria the afghan government uh, want to hide that story from the world Uh, because the afghan government want a good relation with iran as well as with united states so they want to hide the issue of recruiting uh, by iran government because they don't want ask iran to stop this because the iran will be unhappy in this critical situation that will be very hard for afghan government uh, to to lose iran because from one side we are with pakistan there are too many challenges for the government from that side for the people of afghanistan and from other side we don't want to make Uh, upset our big brother the united state so the afghan government was not uh, happy to share information with me about this that i i talked with several sources and like that but i didn't find anything good so i started from another angle but uh, during my way from my home to my office one day i was picked up by a a car first they stopped my car and then they said no worries we are the government uh, guys but they was with local dress and 
And I was worried what kind of people they are. I didn't meet them before. And I said that might be like some people, are, uh, there are uh, different groups in Kabul. They're operating. We don't know which group is that. So I said, okay, they, they take, uh, uh, and they put me in their vehicle and they didn't, they, uh, they, uh, they asked me to give them my mobile phone and my laptop and my other things. So I did this and they put, um, they, after 10 or 15 minutes, they brought me to a place. I understand this is the facilities of the NDS. The NDS is like uh, intelligence department. So they asked me uh, to give them my passwords, my everything. So I, I denied at first and then, you know, they said, uh, if you come here, there is possibility you will never go back from here because too many people are coming. Uh, we brought them here and they never uh, meet their families and friends back. So you should give your password and this stuff. I did this and they asked for my emails to give the passwords of my emails. Uh, I, do, I, do, I did this as well. So then after uh, some question, they asked me about why you, are in, uh, uh, you like to report on that issue. It's a very critical issue and you will not find sources and uh, it's not good and blah, 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 like this. And after that, uh, at the final, my family was searching for me for 48 hours. They didn't find me. They, they finally, they, uh, one of my friends went to the, uh, to the a telecom company uh, it's uh, called Roshan, so my, tele my, my phone was belonged to the, uh, this, I had the SIM card, and then my, my family asked them, so, uh, and my friends, this, this guy is missing, so could, could you please find the location where he is? So they find the location I was, uh, uh, they, 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 they recognize the location, it was in this facility. And I'm lucky that one of my friends was working in that company, so he privately helped the friends to find the location. And so then my family, after 48 hours, they said, oh, he is alive. Yeah, that's, that was a good news for them. And so after 48 hours, they signed a paper on me and they says, you have no right to report that critical issue. Yeah, and I signed that and they leave me back to my place and they hand over my stuff to me, but laptop was with them for one month. and. Uh, even the situation is very hard, but we are not giving up. We are, when we choose uh, this profession, and when we start working with media in Afghanistan, it's not too easy like working in the United States, in, in, in India, or in, in other what, parts of the what, world. What, 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 what advice would you give other reporters that would go to do something like that? From this experience you've had, what what would be your uh, what would be your advice to reporters that would like to cover other conflicts? Yeah, even the safety is first for us, but uh, everyone should. Uh, I think the good relation with with journalist unions, with the organization they protect journalists, it's very good to have a good relation with them. Is the one way. The other is if. The journalists have to protect themselves by their self. You know, they have to, f uh, pro you know, in the, in the conflict zone, it's very hard for journalists to protect themselves. But everyone has their own uh, methods to how to deal with this situation. But in my country, the situation is different. Uh, we are told what by- What are your methods? Uh, uh, we are told by the police and by army to not uh, visit uh, far from provinces like Kunduz and Kandahar, which is in the border with Pakistan, with Iran line. So we are, we are told do not visit this place, but we, we have a very good relation with local people. Yeah, I'm always using the local people as a very good supporter of me and the good sources, and they are the only uh, uh, power tool which I have, and they help me a lot when I'm, I'm in the case of Kunduz, uh, the people helped us a lot because, yeah, their story was, it was a very big story. And the, the, the hospital, uh, it was a hospital, it was clear to all. It was in Google Map. And they target the hospital and everything was, yeah, destroyed there. But the local peoples, yeah, we have to be very good with local peoples. And the local peoples are really helpful to us. Uh, Malini. 
the local trust. You talked also about trust, but you also talked about training, about knowing what to do in difficult circumstances, that you had received training from, from your previous job, and that made your life easier. What other advice would you give to, to uh, journalists who all of a sudden have to start covering a conflict? Mm -hmm. um, again, it's only by doing that you learned. I didn't go as a trained <laughs> conflict reporter. Um, the advantages that I had was this, uh, you know, having the fundamental principles of being neutral and impartial, that helped. And I completely agree with Mirvais that uh, the local support, you know, it's amazing how the moment they know that you're not siding with either of them, how uh, wonderfully they come forward and talk about their situation. I think that trust needs to be maintained and also ensure that they don't uh, get into trouble. And that, that, is, that is an important part, I would say, that... Uh, to you know, to respect that, and also to ensure that uh, we don't foolishly you know disclose uh, them or you know get them into trouble. That is one major. Difference. What about do you use, for example, uh, do you cultivate sources within the security services or within the armed uh, rebel groups? Uh, sources that you can that can also tell you what's happening inside. What are what's next? What are they going to do next? Do you, either of you cultivate these sources? Or? We have uh, inside sources among the army, among the police and other forces, but uh, according to the Afghan constitution, Article 35, um, everyone has access to free media and uh, we, according to the Afghan media law, uh, we, uh, the privacy of our sources are very important for us and we cannot uh, disclose our sources till there is an order from the court. So the privacy of the sources is very important for us. Yeah. yeah uh, you see, I, I think uh, the, the yeah, in my case, gradually the police stopped giving even the press releases because uh, they're finding it difficult to uh, say that, you know, almost as if the press release would come and then uh, the reporting would, the real report would come out. Uh, but uh, in, in our situation, it was impossible to sort of, one, get in touch with the Maoists or some of the people there because you also know that there is a law following chasing you. So we didn't want to get into trouble. The second thing is that uh, also didn't want to fall into the trap of their own propaganda. So that yeah. is something we need to be cautious about. And uh, also there is no way of communicating. There are no phone calls working. There are no, uh, you know, it's not that uh, unless until they come out and make a phone call. They do reach out to journalists to, you know, send a mail to say that some events have happened. They do reach out to the uh, journalists, definitely. Uh, that's when sort of, you know, people also respond. Sometimes, I mean, I've not been to any of those, but sometimes they even call a press conference in a very far away place and uh, have a small meeting to say that what they are doing. So uh, those kind of reports do uh, get onto the paper. Uh, but uh, it's not very, uh, you know, minor steps that you uh, look at. But otherwise, the larger uh, objective and everything is already available on the net. So they make it all public. I think we've run out of, uh, out of time. But if anybody has a very important question they have to, they have to make to any of the panelists, please. Anuhita. which people could uh, respond to um, about the hierarchies of conflict. Uh, Mirwais will forgive me since I've been in Afghanistan for eight years. Afghanistan is and was a sexy conflict. But as our other speakers have pointed out, if you go to Nepal, perhaps only the Nepali journalists were covering a conflict. If you go to India, most Indian journalists are not covering the conflict. And I think that's something that covering conflict war reporters, conflict reporters should think about. Uh, then when you're covering a conflict, even within the conflict, the violence, the bombing, the death toll takes 90 to 95 percent of your, uh, the coverage. People are not looking at the backstory. If you uh, start looking at the backstory as perhaps Malni is doing, then you're uh, considered to be somehow, um, you know, making a um, giving an excuse for the violence. And I think that's something that people should talk about, including 
organizations which are, suffering, uh, which are supporting those who are covering uh, conflict. Uh, in my eight years in Afghanistan, I finally ended up telling a lot of uh, commissioning editors, I'm not a bomb blast bimbo. You know, take, take the backstory from me, take the context, but very few people were interested. I, there was another question. India and work with the paper called the Telegraph there. Mirwais, uh, I see you report for TRT and DW, and I assume you have reported for local papers as well. Have you? Uh, yeah, some of our reports are, uh, you know, uh, DW, uh, I'm working with the Afghan service of DW, it's not in Deutsch right. language, but it's an Afghan language. But yeah, I'm, uh, I, uh, I have some stories which I cannot, uh, publish that through the official organization where I'm working with, but we uh, publish these stories by like changed name in a local papers. And my question is, yeah. how is the storytelling different uh, when you report for foreign uh, organizations and when you report for the local news media? Yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it, it depends to uh, our national interests. According to our uh, uh, constitution and media law, we cannot touch the, inter the, the, the national interests. So there are some stories which are uh, like very, uh, they are about critical religious issues and uh, they touch the national interests and they are untold stories uh, from uh, some high ranking official about the uh, inside uh, corruption corruption of the elites, uh, what's going on uh, inside the, 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 the private meetings of the politician and elites, these kind of stories we, uh, we can publish through the local newspapers. Yeah, we have, uh, right now we have more than, uh, more than 150 FM radio stations by the support of Internews and uh, Anahita, no better, yeah. She helped a lot with Afghan journalists. She is, yeah, everyone know her. Yeah, thanks for Anahita. And we have newspapers, more than 3,000 newspapers, magazine, and other publications. So the untold story and the, the very sensitive issues are coming through the local papers on daily basis, and the people really like it. But the, the, but we, uh, I'm working with the international channels that issues are different. It's about conflict, about political clashes of between the countries, and nowadays the situation is very hard and uh, the, the relation is worst ever between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and Afghanistan and India, uh, Pakistan and India. So this is why these stories are very important for international media and they're con concentrating on that. Yeah. Uh, just perhaps a tangential response. Um, I think uh, we all, for example, in Nepal, we're all concerned sometimes the international media is not paying attention to Nepal and we're not writing enough and there are not enough, enough local reporters with the skills to, to report internationally and we have to be really dependent upon New Delhi media to be paying some attention to us. But sometimes perhaps coverage is not as useful uh, and if there is not enough to cover, that probably means that your country is at peace. But, but more like what I wanted to say was this, that I think in the end we must, the, the most fulfillment one gets as a journalist is one, when one reports for one's own kind uh, as professionally as possible rather than bother about what international media does or does not cover that. Because in the end it is what you report about the local realities that will impact local politics and therefore then there will be a local resolution. So the more powerful conflict reporting locally, which means of course you have to have the outlets and the channels and the print media, etc. But I think occasionally in Nepal we also get carried away with the, this focus on who's covering us and who's not. And I know that was not your question. All I'll say in conclusion is just that I think the stronger local journalism, the better for the local people, which is what matters. And uh, just to, I think, to close the session, because we are, I think, over time, no? No, we are still. Um, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of ideas that come from, from a lot of years of experience of working with the world. One of the two discoveries we did in my country, in Colombia, in the other corner of the world, 
is, first of all, you have to look for the profiteers. Who is profiting from the wars? Always, the, the wars are always, somebody's profiting. And sometimes when the conflict is very acute, you cannot report that because it, they, you will get killed. But, but whenever you have a, a respite, whenever you have a, a chance and see the opportunity, I think that's a key issue. And the other issue is to use databases, to, to, to systematically count and, and, and follow exactly where the killings are taking place and how. Because when you report one by one, you don't see the whole picture. So what we did in Colombia, for example, we followed why and how journalists were being killed in the whole country because there was like, oh, so-and-so was killed here. We also had 52 journalists uh, killed in, in 15 years. And when we started to see now a little bit, when the, the, the conflict started to cool down a little bit, we, we went back and we saw it was completely strategic. Every time they wanted to to enter into a, the paramilitary or the guerrillas who wanted to enter a new area of the country, they would kill two or three journalists so that they would silence anybody. So it wasn't even about what that journalist was investigating. Or it was about silencing. And they did that systematically. If we had known that, if we had seen that on time, then we would have guessed where the war was going and what were the the threats of war. The other thing that we did was to map out all the massacres of the country, and then you could see how the, the war moved from one place to the other, but also you started to see the relationship of what you were saying, Malini, with, uh, with, uh, with mineral resources. The, what was the fight really about? About the forest, about some people protecting some areas, about the drugs, so, so I think that's, that's the other part that I think it's very important to have in mind, not to be just reporting, like Anohita said, the, the, the victims of every day, but also what is happening behind. Yeah, but I want to add something that uh, the bad news are good news for us, yeah? And good news are no news. Yeah, this is why the conflict news is everywhere at the top, and they are not care about the backstory and what will happen next. So what happened, if you, if you go to Al Jazeera or CNN, or maybe CNN is busy with the election nowadays. If you go to Indy TV and other TV channels, yeah, the, the conflict news and the Kashmir the and these issue and killings are at the top. Even too many people don't like it, but there are at least good news for the TV channels, yeah, to broadcast. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for, to all your panelists.